Welcome back to Hardware Unbox. Today's video is, well, I guess, probably not the usual sort of content we put up on the channel, you know, with loads of benchmarks and that sort of thing. I'm just gonna have a chat with you guys about my Threadripper editing rig, a bit of an update to the build video I did nearly a month ago to give you a bit more info on how the system is doing, a few other upgrades I needed to make, and just our general thoughts on where we've seen benefits to upgrading hardware in our workstations. So far, Threadripper has been an enormous update to my workflow. I think we've mentioned it a few times in the past, but both Steve and I use Adobe Premiere for editing together these videos, and the difference in performance between the Threadripper 2950X and the Ryzen 7 1700X I was using previously is massive. But before we get into that, this video has been sponsored by Vikings War of Clans, a very addictive MMO for iOS and Android devices inspired by PC strategy games from the 90s like Age of Empires, one of my personal favorites. In fact, us Aussies might remember when Age of Empires was included in Kellogg's cereal boxes, but I guess that might be a story for another time. Anyway, Vikings War of Clans is similar to those sorts of games and it has amazing graphics for a mobile title. It allows you to choose your own play style and you can join in the fun with more than 20 million online players fighting over resources, forging alliances, and competing in live events. Support Hardware Unbox by downloading Vikings for free only from the links in the description box below, and get a special bonus of 200 gold coins and a protective shield. Now, let's get back to talking about Threadripper. Obviously, the big one is rendering performance. When we set a video to encode, the 2950X is at least twice as fast. The big game graphics settings comparison videos you've seen before, those were taking between two and a half to three hours to render on the Ryzen 7 1700X. When you ask Premiere to spit out, I guess, 4K, 60 FPS, H.264 at 100 megabits per second using a two-pass encode with a bunch of GPU accelerated effects, an eight-core CPU is gonna struggle. With the 2950X though, those encodes now taking roughly 50 minutes or so uh, to complete. So I guess that's more than a 2X improvement, but it's really more than just rendering performance. The 1700X was absolutely choked up to the maximum when rendering those videos. And that made using my PC for anything else pretty painful. We're talking, you know, loading Chrome tabs, uh, editing some Excel spreadsheets or creating our YouTube thumbnail in Photoshop. None of those tasks were responsive when the 1700X was told to render. To my surprise, the 2950X is pretty different in that regard. Even when the CPU is spending most of the time encoding, there's still a bit of headroom to allow me to say, create that YouTube thumbnail while the encoder is happening. Doing that sort of simultaneous task isn't as fast as if the CPU were being you know, weren't being used, but at least other apps are actually usable now during the rendering process, which is a godsend for productivity, especially when, you know, previously the encodes would take nearly three hours. And that's three hours. I couldn't really use my PC for anything else. I've also heard a few reports suggesting Intel CPUs are faster at the actual editing process. So I'm talking about scrubbing through the timeline, applying effects, playing the video, moving through you know, the Premiere interface, that sort of thing. I did notice a few delays, pauses, slowdowns and the like with my 1700X, but the 2950X, again to my surprise, has actually been a noticeable upgrade to Premiere's responsiveness. Things like scrubbing are faster and smoother with more frames rendered during the scrub and skipping along the timeline then hitting play is now instant rather than say a half second delay before the footage starts. I did a bit of experimenting with similar types of actions on my 8700K test rig and I couldn't make out a significant difference in responsiveness compared to the 2950X. It's certainly not something I'd normally notice while editing. Previously, the 8700K was noticeably more responsive than the 1700X, so very happy with how the 2950X has improved things. Of course, the 8700K was always inferior to both the 1700X and Threadripper for encoding, uh, which is why I didn't consider it for my editing rig in the past. I also mentioned previously that I use my editing rig for gaming. Again, there's no real change to performance between the 2950X and the 1700X as expected. In fact, if anything, the 2950X is a bit faster in CPU demanding games. Not that I'm usually CPU bottlenecked, even with the RTX 2080 Ti, I'm almost always GPU bottlenecked at 3440 by 1440. And yes, I use an ultra wide mono for gaming. It's the Acer Predator X34, in case you're wondering. Um, one of the comments I did see a fair bit on the Threadripper build video was in relation to the CPU cooler. The Corsair H150i Pro doesn't have full TR4 IHS coverage. However, this actually isn't a big deal. I'm not seeing any hot spots and under full load, temperatures are sitting around the 65 degrees Celsius mark. Yes, 
I guess it probably would be cooler had I used a cooler with full IHS coverage, but it's not actually necessary to get decent cooling performance. And for us to make the video, it was actually a lot easier to work with Corsair to get the bulk of the components. Sometimes with these sorts of things, you know, the logistics of actually making a video wins out over getting the absolute top of the line components, which in this case I didn't really need anyway. That said, I haven't spent a lot of time overclocking and I probably won't. I'd have to go all out to get better performance than XFR and Precision Booster already providing. And I don't want to risk stability when I'm working on time, you know, time sensitive projects. Uh, it's with overclocking that you'd normally want a cooler with full IHS coverage, but again, for my rig, it's not really necessary. Also, if I was seeing very high temperatures, I'd probably want that larger cold plate, but you know, that wasn't the case either. But there were some things I needed to upgrade, and I'll talk you through those now. Uh, the big one is memory capacity. 32 gigabytes is simply not enough for editing our 4K videos without running into capacity bottlenecks. With my 1700X, I was mostly CPU bottleneck throughout the editing and encoding process. But with Threadripper, I was running into nasty RAM capacity bottlenecks, which were preventing the 2950X from unleashing its full performance. Especially when overlaying you know, multiple 4K videos at once, uh, my RAM usage would be pegged to the maximum basically all the time. So it's clear that I needed more RAM, and thankfully Team Group were able to help out. They provided 64 gigabytes of their T-Force Nighthawk RGB DDR4. We've got two kits here. I've used this stuff before and it looks, I reckon, especially awesome in my Threadripper build. You can see it in there at the moment because you have dims on both sides of the CPU, so the RGB lighting flanks the RGB cooler. Visuals don't really matter for an editing rig, but it's always nice to have a system that looks good as well as being practical. Um, anyway, it's not the RGB lighting that matters, it's the specific modules team group provided. I specifically wanted four 16 gigabyte sticks rather than eight eight gigabyte sticks, just in case I needed to go up to 128 gigabytes in the future. There's really no other advantage to four times 16 gig over eight times eight gig for this setup. Zen's IMC does perform better with fewer dims, but that's largely negated when using dual rank 16 gig modules. In any case, team group provided two 32 gig kits at 3200 CL16 speeds. They look pretty similar to this. This is actually a 3000 kit, but similar enough. This is Samsung BDI memory, so it's the good stuff. And before you ask, I guess I haven't played around with timings yet, so to see if I could tighten those up any further, though I suspect I can. And my 2950X has no trouble with 3200 CL16 in a four times 16 gigabyte configuration as expected. Uh, with 16 gig rather than 32 gig installed, a lot of my performance problems I was running into have been solved entirely, especially when trying to play back parts of those graphics comparison videos where they're, you know, like five pieces of 4K footage overlaid. With 32 gig of RAM, that section would be played back at like one to two FPS. With 64 gig Premiere, loads up to about 50 gig of RAM and playback is much smoother. It's also decreased render times by a small amount for those graphics comparison videos. And this sort of application where having 64 gig of RAM can be the difference between decent performance and poor performance. As we've mentioned many times in the past, you really don't need more than 16 gig for gaming in modern titles or any sort of basic productivity app. It's when you're going crazy in Premiere or working with large data sets, the pushing up to you know 32 gig, 64 gig, and even 128 gig can make a difference. Unless you're doing something like that or heavily multitasking, we really don't recommend spending big on RAM capacity. In fact, before I switched to 64 gig, 32 gig was more than enough for basically everything else I use my PC for. Even working with more basic projects in Premiere with 4K footage, 32 gig was fine. So if I was recommending a system for a content creator, I'd still go with 32 gig to begin with. 16 gig won't be enough, but for a lot of people, you probably won't see the benefits from upping that to 64 gig. So that should give you guys a bit of a basic rundown of when we've seen the benefits from high memory capacities in our workflow. I guess 16 gig is the sweet spot for gamers. 32 gig is what you want as a content creator with those higher capacities only necessary for niche or specialist tasks. The other thing I added in was a one terabyte Samsung 970 Evo SSD, and this was to use as a scratch disk for Premiere. Uh, previously, I had just a 500 gig PCIe storage drive in there, and that was cutting a bit fine if I was working on you know, multiple projects. We tend to make you know, hundreds of gigabytes for each of our individual videos that we're uploading. The 970 Evo provides a handy random access performance boost as well, which is helped with editing performance. I was tossing up between the 970 Pro and the 970 Evo. The Pro is a bit faster, but the Evo is a better bang for your buck buy, hence why I went with it for this one. While PCIe NVMe SSDs are nice, I actually think a lot of people wouldn't be able to tell the difference between PCIe and SATA SSDs for general things like app loading, Windows booting, system responsiveness productivity tasks, you know, and even game loading and performance. 
Having recently built a few systems that use SATA drives or SATA drives as their boot drives, there's honestly, there isn't a big difference when you bump those up to an NVMe drive, perhaps not as large as the cost difference would suggest. In a lot of cases, I think buyers would be happier with a larger capacity SATA drive than a smaller capacity NVMe drive for general sort of things. Where PCIe NVMe drives become really handy is in these sorts of demanding workloads where storage is constantly being accessed. You know, having those blazing fast sequential speeds backed up with great random performance does help noticeably for Premiere timeline performance at those times when you're asking the drive for data and needing to load stuff into RAM. But for a lot of other tasks, they don't benefit significantly from faster storage. Usually there are bottlenecks elsewhere like CPU performance. So before you buy an NVMe drive, it's always worth looking at your workloads and seeing whether faster storage would benefit you compared to what you get with a SATA drive. I guess that's it for this video, just going over some updates with the Threadripper build and a bit more insight into what we use at Hardware Unboxed as content creators. The hardware we need to do our jobs and I guess as well where we've seen upgrades impact our workflow the most. Let us know if you like these sorts of videos because I find it interesting when other creators talk about how what you know what they use to create videos and how they go about it. So hopefully a few of you have found this video interesting. Next up for me, we'll probably be sorting out a better system for archival storage on hard drives. Currently it's a bit of a mess around here with drives everywhere. Definitely need a better solution to that. What else? I guess you can subscribe for more hardware unbox content. Consider supporting us on Patreon to get access to our exclusive Discord chat and behind the scenes videos. And I'll catch you in the next one.